This episode is brought to you by our wonderful sponsors, Galaxy Finance. Sponsors and personal friends that I trust, that I trust enough to go to with questions about my own finances. That's not a sales pitch, that's fact. Any questions, any queries, they have the solutions from home loan lending to complete financial planning. With official interest rates at an all-time low, the lenders want your business. With Galaxy Finance, they'll do all the work for you and find the best possible deal. They'll do it all. Get in contact, ask for Leanne, and mention Unfiltered for a free chat. A free chat. No obligations. A free chat just by mentioning Unfiltered. Galaxyfinance.com.au is where you can find them. The great ones, they're different. They really are. Not better, just different. Sure, there's a physical power, a mental strength, a complex but resolute constitution too. There's a whole lot more than just the measurables. That's something else, that intangible. It separates us from them. Welcome to the Legends series on Andy Raymond Unfiltered. There's the talented ones, then there's guys like this, simply amazing. Try and describe this one in just a paragraph. It's impossible. A game breaker, a footballing magician, and one that made it look just so easy. But who is Michael O'Connor? Michael O'Connor is the son of a school teacher who grew up by and large in Canberra from the age of 6 to 19. Um, my mother uh, is from the bush, a uh, country family, country folk from the Forbes area. Uh, and uh, that happened to be where my father was teaching. Uh, um, subsequently, uh, they married, moved to Nowra on the south coast of New South Wales, uh, where I spent the first six years of my life before my father got a job in Canberra and uh, I spent from the age of six to nearly 20 uh, in Canberra uh, and that was uh, they were the formative years of my life uh, and um, probably and I, this, I hope this doesn't uh, sound nasty but Canberra was a big motivation for me to, tr- to want to travel uh, mm. I, I, you know I really uh, a great city to, to grow up in, in in that the schools were great the facilities sporting facilities I lived across the road from an oval and I spent hours and hours uh, playing sport uh, but it really gave me that uh, I think living in Canberra really the cold winters and uh, really gave me that impetus to want to travel and see the world yeah short question probably not a short answer are you a rugby league guy or are you a rugby union guy? <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, look, the more people ask me, you know, that's it, probably the most common question I get. What, what do I are you, do? You, do you like which game? Do you prefer rugby union yeah. or rugby league? Honestly, I I enjoyed them both immensely and still do. I think I was a better rugby league player because of. I was more of a um, a finisher, um, yep. not so much a creator, and there weren't as many defenders. Uh, there aren't there aren't as many defenders on the field, so I had more opportunity ball in hand than I had when I was playing rugby. Uh, rugby has other things that rugby league doesn't have, like mm. the, the trips overseas, uh, you know, the red carpet treatment, visiting Buckingham Palace, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so culturally, very, very different there. Um, but when it boils down to it, the players aren't a lot. Uh, th- there's not a lot of difference. You know, they they, they enjoy um, a camaraderie. People play team sports because they like playing. You know, they're not individuals basically. Yep. And uh, so you you build friendships, uh, and I build a lot of friendships in both rugby league and rugby union. Yeah. So there's the question that's been asked the most. Is there a logical question that you've never been asked and you think, why not? Uh, No, that is a good question, but not really. I think that 
there's there, there's a lot of hard work goes into uh, you know reaching the top of your sport in your country yeah. and but also there's a fair bit of luck that sort of has to fall your way and you know I look back on my childhood and I had a horrific car accident with my father um, I had an incident when I was uh, only about nine or ten at the uh, Olympic swimming pool in Canberra where somebody jumped off a, a tower and uh, ended up with the knees in my back um, and I was in hospital paral I can remember just floating down to the bottom of the pool and uh, I was paralyzed and uh, and the doctor saying a couple of days afterwards uh, you know it, it was so close you know you, you were so close to becoming uh, you know a, a cripple so you you look at I mean life is uh, oh, it's, it's hazardous and uh, you've got to and I, I think I've been lucky I've had a good road uh, I had a great career in uh, in rugby union I got to travel and see the world and and I was very fortunate uh, when I made my crossover to St George and subsequently Manly I played with good teams and uh, had good players around me and um, and uh, you know I, I had really. Uh, you know, I had a great career. No, no regrets at all. By the sounds of things, you used up a lot of your luck as a as a child between the car accident and the swimming pool accident. Yeah, I did, and I thought I've always sort of I've been a bit lucky in life. I think I've just been able to pull my foot out of the door at the right time, and uh, and that goes for everything really. Uh, you know, moving up here when I finished playing football, my wife was from Queensland, so. That was a natural thing to do after she'd spent 10 years down in Sydney. Uh, we've really enjoyed uh, living up here for nearly 25, 26 years, uh, raising a family. Uh, my kids are all grown up now. My youngest is uh, 20, 28, 29. They've all got, they're all a lot smarter than their dad. Uh, uh, they've all, all got great educations. And uh, so I, I've, been, I've been fortunate. I've, I'm one of the lucky ones. Uh, I took a few head knocks uh, when I was playing, and mm. uh, I don't know how that's all going to play out. But uh, so, apologies in this interview if uh, <laughs> if I forget things. Side note: Michael and I are neighbours up here on the beautiful Sunshine Coast of Queensland. Do you get used to the Queenslanders? Does the sledging still continue all these years later at Origin time? Yeah, uh, it can be. Uh, can, it's cost me a lot of uh, a lot of cases of beer over the years. I know that, um, but I'm pretty immune to it now. Yeah. Um, it's all good natured stuff, and it's great. I, I mean, I love it. There's nothing more exciting than watching a, a state of origin, and um, you know, um, I think that uh, the fact that I, uh, when people meet me for the first time, and I get that sort of oh. You know, if they're que from Queensland, oh, you, you know, you're the bastard that you know, yeah. kicked that goal in 1991. I don't get that in New South Wales. I get a, a, a lot sort of warmer reception for yeah. people first up. Uh, but then, you know, it's all, it's all good. Let's go back to the start, mate. And I think the start here, athletically, is the 77 Australian schoolboys rugby side that, that toured France, Great Britain and Japan. They were the original Invincibles before the Rugby League side of 82. Quite possibly the greatest assembly of youngsters, any code that we'd seen. What are your fondest memories or moments from the schoolboys tour of 77, 78? Well, it was just uh, that whole thing of getting out of Canberra and mm. uh, seeing the world. Uh, you know, Canberra was... Uh, I just became... Um, you know, I just... Uh, it was full of embassies and uh, you know I was just looking for ways looking for ways to, to, to see the world and yeah. and this was a great opportunity a one a one off like uh, a tour to the northern hemisphere and we went to Japan and we went to Holland we went to France uh, all through the British Isles for a couple of months and it was a trip of a lifetime and so I worked really hard to uh, make sure I got on that and nearly didn't um, I played in a um, in a game that basically was going to decide uh, who the inside centre was going to be for the tour mm. um, and uh, my opponent was Wally Lewis so. yeah. 
and uh, and I'd never played bolly before, mm. and uh, it was just such. I was just. It was a real good lesson for me because he he totally intimidated me from not shaping my hand. We're both captains of our to- uh, respective captains of our teams. Yeah. Wouldn't shake hands at the start, and uh, uh, and then you know for the whole game, whether I passed the ball, held the ball, he'd he'd take me out every you know, every time. He'd verbal me. He just uh, absolutely outplayed me. But I did get another chance to uh, redeem myself in a in a possibles probables uh, game, uh, and I and I just squeezed in that tour. But uh, yeah, that was that was a good experience. And but that whole uh, that team, it's interesting what you say because uh, there was a sporting magazine, and this goes back fifteen or twenty years now. I think fifteen years ago, because we meet, uh, we have reunions every couple of years, every five years mm. at, at least. And uh, Bob Wallace, our manager, uh, had a, an article, uh, Sports Illustrated, one of the big magazines, in, mm. in, uh, and they, they named the top uh, 50 all-time, uh, an international magazine, all-time sporting teams, and we came in in like 47th or 48th or something. Schoolboys. Of all time, yeah. Wow. So it was, when you, when you have a look at that, the results we, we achieved and uh, the players that came from that, uh, you had the three Ella brothers, uh, mm. Wally Lewis, just a uh, Tony Milrose, the skipper. Tony was the skipper. Yep, yeah, yeah. Um, and he's, yeah, and you know Michael Hawker. Uh, just a wonderful array of players who went on to have uh, great careers. Leaders, uh, Michael Maxwell, who went into business, and mm. uh, we all just went out on. Uh, he's uh, it's, he invited uh, half a dozen of us recently. He's got a he's just built a resort on Lord Howe Island and. Uh, so it's interesting where, where players end up. Uh, so, yeah, no, it's a really interesting, good crew of guys. This episode is brought to you by our wonderful sponsors, Galaxy Finance. Sponsors and personal friends that I trust, that I trust enough to go to with questions about my own finances. That's not a sales pitch, that's fact. Any questions, any queries, they have the solutions from home loan lending to complete financial planning. With official interest rates at an all-time low, the lenders want your business. With Galaxy Finance, they'll do all the work for you and find the best possible deal. They'll do it all. Get in contact, ask for Leanne and mention Unfiltered for a free chat. A free chat. No obligations, a free chat just by mentioning Unfiltered. Galaxyfinance.com.au is where you can find them. Australian rugby senior level anyway wasn't in great, great shape. You guys and the running style of football mixed with your athleticism were very much, even as kids, seen as the saviours. There's some pressure for a young group of men. Yeah, but that was good pressure. I, we, we were we were young and keen, and particularly after that, having success in uh, on, on the schoolboy tour, I was really keen to sort of hook up with the Ella boys again and mm. uh, Michael Hawker, which we did in '81 uh, yep. in the Bledisloe, uh, and it was great. You know, it was a real fresh uh, breath of fresh air. Really, um, we played running rugby, and uh, we were able to pick up the Bledisloe for the first time in. 20 something years, 27 years or something. 13 tests for the Wallabies, Mick. It was a wonderful time between 79 and 82 for Australian rugby. Yeah, it was, yeah. And then and, and it all kicked off with me. Uh, I got selected to go to Argentina and it was a possibles probables game uh, that, that uh, and I can still remember uh, hearing my name read out afterwards, you know, like uh, I was only 19. Uh, I think the second youngest ever wallaby to be selected uh but once again coming from canberra and uh you know and 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 playing this possibles probables and then they announce the side afterwards and just hearing your name uh you're on the plane to argentina and you know back then in 1979 it was just such a oh just 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 an adventure yeah to go to a country like argentina there was a military rule over there Mm. took us two days to get there we had to go up through america and Colombia and all these places, Bogota, and uh, and um, it was just fascinating back then, uh, and to see you know where rugby was being played as well, mm. and we were getting big crowds, uh, um, so uh, that was a great experience. 
you talk with such positivity about the union days. Obviously, the memories are great. So I do have to ask, why the code switch? Why league in 83? Was it very simply a business decision? Yeah, it was, really. Yep. Yeah, it was. Uh, well, Roy Masters had come up and uh, made me an offer the year before. And I knocked it back because we had that uh, British Isles tour yep. in 81. And uh, I subsequently went on that. It wasn't, we ended up having a pretty, uh, oh, it wasn't disappointing, but we only, we won the one test match and that was in Ireland. The final game was uh, rained out, snowed out, sorry, um, the Barbarians match. And it was a pretty sort of, there's a lot of controversy on the tour and injuries. I got mm. injured. And then the following year, uh, Roy made me another offer. And it was just, you know, like I was a, I was pulling beers at the Paddington Hotel and putting myself the, through university. Like I wasn't getting any money at all playing rugby union in Brisbane. And uh, the money back then at the time, it was like, I think it was $40,000, uh, you know, and, and $40,000 back in the, yeah. you know, the, in the mid to... Serious dollars. Oh, it was. It was just, uh, I couldn't knock it back. So the one thing that I did say to Roy was, look, um, the only thing that's holding me back here is uh, is travel. Like, you know, it's... Because Sydney, the Sydney competition, the Winfield Cup, was very much a Sydney suburban competition back then. And yeah, you mate, first tra- travel down the highway to Canberra and that was it. Well, not even Canberra. Canberra weren't in uh, when I... Uh, uh, no, no, they'd come in in 82. 82 they had, yeah, yeah. you're right, actually. Um, okay, so we... Yeah, Canberra would have been... By far and away, we're out to Penrith. Yeah. So I said to Roy, look, um, you know, that, that's the thing that's holding me back is I uh, really enjoy my travel. And yeah, yeah. Uh, he said, oh, well, mate, don't worry about that. He said, we go to Hawaii. And uh, last year, the boys went to Hawaii and always a good end of season trip. And that was that was it for me. I signed on the dotted line. And then our trip to Hawaii got cancelled. <laughs> We had all of our uh, trip away funds in the Nugent Hand Bank, and uh, and it went belly up. So oh. the following year, I got onto the trip away committee with uh, um, with Graham Wynn, and yep. um, he was working for Penfolds at the time, and uh, and so was I. And we decided we'd uh, we went to the MD, and he allocated some uh, cases of Penfolds for us to sell, and and every player had to sell two cases, and uh, it was enough to get us to Rio. So we ended up going. Expensive wine. Well, we ended up going to. uh, We took um, forty odd players to Rio de Janeiro in 1986, 87, on an end of season trip. There was no rugby world cup back then. the The cup started in eighty seven, if I'm correct. Mm. Had there been a world cup to aspire to, would have you stayed in rugby union, perhaps? Mm, I haven't. No, I haven't really thought of that. I. Probably not. No, yeah. no. There was just an opportunity then and there to 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 um, and and really like once I made that decision, um, look, I, I haven't looked back. And yep. uh, yeah, that's, and that's how life is, isn't it? You've got to make a decision and move on. And um, but I don't think so. I think rugby rugby still didn't. It wasn't professional until. 1995, 1996, yeah. so... Look, You'd I, still be pulling beers at the paddo. I'd still be pulling beers at the paddo, yeah. yeah. March 13, 1983, Cogra Oval, 6,476 fans. Martin Weeks was the referee. It was St George Western Suburbs. And you were in jersey number 14 on debut. You did score a try as we sit here some 38 years later. What do you remember of debut day? Oh, very nervous. Um, it was funny, you know. I had uh, that game. Um, I, 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 I got tackled and just uh, released the ball. Uh, it was you know, it was just it was just an automatic thing yeah. that I coming coming from rugby. And uh, I remember the look I got from Rod Reddy. And uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, but we, um, yeah. That, that, they were really good days, uh, St George, and the um, the <laughs> we we definitely had the toughest forward pack in the competition. I, um, and that, and it was good to have play with guys like Craig Young and Rocket Ready, uh, Robert Stone. Unfortunately, he's passed away, yep. but uh, there's Graham Wynn. We had a really strong forward pack, and and that made things easier. Um, 
but I think we, in in hindsight, when I look at my my years at St George, we probably relied too much on our forwards, yeah. and uh, and moving over to Manly, um, it was a it was a lot more freedom to sort of throw the ball early in the tackle count, and uh, and that was a big reason uh, why I went. In, I finally did go to Manly in in, in eighty seven. What were the differences? on and importantly off the field between the codes that you noticed league was very much the blue collar game culture and environment uh union seemed very much as the white collar was there an adjustment that needed to be made yeah i think uh an adjustment from me yeah also uh like a lot of people just think because you come from rugby uh, if you're a rugby league player that you must be a doctor or a lawyer or uh, yeah. and when when they find that you're not that you that you, you don't mind the beer and a punt and uh you know the things that and basically footballers are the same they talk about the same things afterwards yep. about the game and uh they like to um you know have a few beers and yeah. um embellish yeah embellish <laughs> yeah yeah but um you know i i i, I was just I suppose there was, uh, but there was a little, and, and and you'd cop it a little bit, uh, you know, mm. the, the the white collar stuff. And yeah. But when they find out that you really, you know, like you just, like, you're not. Name. I'm not a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was pulling beers at the pub at the at the Paddington Hotel, and I was going to be a school teacher, uh, but I never quite uh, finished that. I, I did my degree, but I didn't do my teaching yeah. uh, year. But um, that would have been another life. Yeah. You'd play 78 games for the Dragons between 1983 and 86, 33 tries, 130 goals, and a grand final appearance in 85 against the original Dogs of War. Tough, nasty, and mean. That was their reputation. Were they the toughest side, perhaps, that you faced? I reckon they were, you know. Uh, <clears throat> apart from the... Fer- the ferociousness of the the All Blacks that you, you know you, you, yeah. you get from them, uh, I reckon the Bulldogs back in the eighties. Well, here you go. I don't think, and I'm sure, apart from a trial match that I played at Manly in my first year at Manly, mm. I never won in ten years. I never won a game at Belmore. Wow! Uh, and uh, it was just such a f- uh, fortress for them, and uh, and they had yeah, they really uncompromising. <laughs> Defence orientated, uh, you know, Andrew Farrer, Chris Mortimer, um, players, just really, really tough, tough centres, you know, mm. uh, hard to, you know, they weren't worried about any, a little bit like Wally Lewis when you play against Wally, he's not yeah. worried about anybody else on the field, he's just worried about you, and so you'd pass the ball and they'd take you out, and, uh, you know, you, you, I remember I copped a high hit uh, in, the, in the first couple of minutes in that grand final by um, Andrew Farrer, and uh, oh, I was just, uh, I was stunned, for, you know. Uh, so I got a bit, you know, I, I don't remember a lot of the game. I've, right. I've seen it, um, and it was, um, we, in, that, in that year, we were probably the best team. I'd, I'd yeah. say we were. Uh, we beat them pretty comfortably in the major semi, and uh, we'd won the, uh, the, the, the two lower grades, so it would have been a historic year for St George, and, uh, and that's saying something from, for them for a club. Uh, but we, uh, that was one of the most disappointing losses, I think, in my career because uh, I, I honestly expected and we'd, d- we'd done the work through the year to win mm. that grand final, but uh, Warren Ryan just sort of, I think, outsmarted us on the day. Um, he, um, he took full advantage of an old rule where they kicked a lot to the in goal. Uh, and our, our fullback, um, Glenn Burgess, uh, would simply take the the high ball and uh, then it was a, dr- a line dropout back then mm. it wasn't uh, you didn't run out to the 22 yeah. so we couldn't get out of our half no. and uh, we, we spent the whole game just uh, on your tr- heels didn't yeah you? trying to get out of our half yeah. and and they won it we hope you're enjoying the Michael O'Connor story there's more to come we talk about the 1987 grand final about regrets oh and that kick you remember it If you're enjoying Before You Go, we'd ask you to leave a five-star rating and review on the podcast app you're currently listening on. It helps us spread the word as we continue to grow the podcast. Make sure you come back soon, legends.
This episode is brought to you by our wonderful sponsors at Griffin Air Conditioning. Visit them at griffinair.com.au. Welcome back to Andy Raymond Unfiltered, the Legends series and the Michael O'Connor story. Previously, we've spoken about the greatest schoolboy side ever assembled and the switch from union to league. The story continues. 7-6. Yeah. It was Andrew Farrell, was it, that broke your heart with a field goal and almost your nose from that uh, high shot early? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the old nose, it, it, was, it, was, it was broken uh, well and truly before then. Uh, I went through my career in rugby union without a broken nose and I broke it seven times playing rugby league. <laughs> Actually, rewind to the start of that year. 85 was when you first started regularly kicking goals for the club. Yeah. One of the first, maybe after Johnny Gray at North Sydney, of the new style round the corner kickers. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Johnny Gray, I think, was the first. Ross Condon was a prodigious uh, yeah. kicker at the time. Gee, he was a good goal kicker. Uh, but I grew up playing soccer as well on the Oval across the road from my house. Okay. And, Next door neighbour was Italian and uh, he was a soccer coach. and yeah. uh, So I, um, <clears throat> I was able to perfect that around the corner. That's, it's just a soccer kick for me and yep. it came very naturally. Um, but it was then it just a, it was a matter of practice and um, like anything, you know. And uh, it, it was great for me because it was an extra asset when it came to you know, higher representative honours, yeah. you know. Like for example, 1986. Um, yep. You know, it, it really gave me a leg up when, when you when you got competition like Brett Kenny, uh, Gene Miles, Mal Meninga. Uh, so one of those guys uh, ultimately had to miss out on the test squad because uh, Mal wasn't kicking goals well then. No. Yeah. So uh, so I, I reckon I you know I, I'm I'd be happy to say that I got in because of my goal kicking. You need a goal kicker at that level, mm. and uh, and I worked on it pretty hard. So. 1985 New South Wales debut. 1986 Australian debut. You'd become only the 37th man to be labelled a dual international, following Ray Price, preceding Ricky Stewart. What does that title mean to you, dual international? Does it hold a special place in the heart? Um, I think it's more just a recognition, I suppose. It's just, uh, you know, but, but yeah, people do refer to me as the... Mm. Uh, at the golf club, they call me, um, you know, because you know, they're... The, the legend or the jewel or yeah. you know like uh but it's it's something that they um you know accept and they acknowledge accept and acknowledge yeah. yeah yeah um i don't know uh it is it, it's a, it's an achievement that you know that you obviously you know your life's for everybody for you know you you, you want to try and achieve and mm. leave leave something and uh and so that that's a great honor mm. for me yeah you're still the most humble bloke i've ever met in all these years <laughs> The 1986 Kangaroo Tour, the unbeatables. Only Terry Lamb played more games than you, and that was just to keep him out of the pubs. <laughs> What's your fondest tour uh, memory, Mick? Um, three tries at Old Trafford in Test 1, or is there a tour highlight that's away from the field? Oh, look, I'll have to keep it on the straight and narrow and say that... No, re- seriously, that first Test match uh, at Old Trafford, I've never... I don't think I ever felt an electric a- atmosphere like it. This the singing and yeah. it was packed to the rafters, uh, Old Trafford, and uh, there was a genuine belief that they could beat us. Mm. Uh, they had a good team, like you know your Ellery Hanleys. This was a, uh, a side that was prepared, really prepared to mm. to, to beat us. And if ever we we're going to uh, lose, it was that first Test match. And um, just the excitement and the adrenaline that I had, uh, and and to score three tries. Uh, was unbelievable, and mm. then just the noise, and the, and they were appreciative too. Like they were a good crowd. Um, the singing, and uh, but we put on a masterclass. Like you know, the back line was Sterling, Lewis, Meninga. Uh, sorry, uh, Miles, Gene Miles, Brett Kenny, myself. Like Mal couldn't get into the side. No, no, he was on the bench. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that just shows you the the, the depth that we had, and. Uh, 
So I don't think I've ever been so uh, excited about playing and enjoyed a game of, of football as much as that one because, uh, and it was a great relief to beat them. Who was your roomie for the tour? And out of 10, what marking do they get? Oh, Gary Belcher. Um, They've got two of the nice guys yeah, together. Gary they Belcher. gave you someone sane. That's yeah. positive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I always had pretty good roomies, you know. Um, you know, I, I, my first roommate ever uh, on a trip was on an international trip to Argentina was a bloke called Stan Pilecki, and he was a chain smoker. Yep. And um, so that was interesting when you got, you know, you got no air conditioning. I mean, you can't open your windows yeah. and you wake up and you're sort of in a haze of smoke. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Mick, I you think can... I read something somewhere that you rate that 86 side, the unbeatables, as the best you played with. Is that right? It'd be the best, I, I think the best back line that I played with. Mm. Yeah, I, just the, 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 when you have a look at them, the players individually and how we all came together. Gary Jack was the fullback. Um, and, you know, Gary Belcher, Gary Jack, they're two of the greatest fullbacks. Uh, Underrated for mine, the pair of them. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that would be, as cl- you know, close to as good a back line I've ever played in, yeah. By now... You know that no one likes Manly, and as the regular sign on the Brookvale Hill says, Manly hates you too. Mm. Why the Eagles, Mick? Business decision again? Yeah, once again, I, I, I was going to move uh, the year before, and and I uh, I stayed for 1986. I was dis- really dis- bitterly disappointed. 85, losing that grand final. Wanted to win a grand final, and I thought, probably selfishly, I thought. Uh, that a change was as good as yep. a holiday and uh, look, the money was good and they obviously offered uh, significantly more than St George but then St George didn't match the offer and then they did right and it was too late yep. when, uh, so I'd already made up my mind and decided to go to Manly and it was a good move it was like a breath of fresh air and went over to uh, and um, Doug Daly uh, mm was the uh, CEO at the time. He really looked after them. And what they did do well was look after families and uh, everything was great off the field. You didn't have to worry about that. Uh, very professional club. And uh, to me, it was probably more like a rugby club than any other club uh, in okay. Sydney uh, because of the uh, just the social activities. The wives got on well, uh, the families. Uh, just a really good group of blokes. And you just... I remember going to training and just not wanting, you know, just staying at training. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a bit of touch footy after with Cliffy and, uh, you know, just enjoyed getting wow. together with these guys and uh, enjoyed their company. And, uh, and, this, and, and and that's when you know when you've had enough, when you, you know, you're not enjoying training, when it becomes laborious and, you mm. you know, you, 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 see, you often see players, they, as soon as training finishes, well, they don't even hang around for a shower, they're yeah. gone, you know. Um, that was never the case that, at Brookie, it yeah. was always, yeah, it was great to get there and couldn't wait to get there and, you know, get home late. The 1987 Grand Final and Premiership, a highlight, no doubt. Is it the highlight? Yeah, I, well, it would be because uh, I did want to win a Premiership and uh, mm-hmm. and that was our best chance. Uh, once again, we were the probably the best side all year. Mm-hmm. But we got a real scare in the in the major semi against uh, the Roosters, and uh, that was a real wake up call for us. And uh, and we were just coming up against a, a, one of the great Canberra sides, you know, and they, they, they yeah. were in the in the throes of, uh, of just something great. And yeah. they did; they they went on to become a, a you know t- truly champion side. But uh, we got them at the right time, just before. Mm. Uh, they peaked, and yeah. uh, but they had a great year too. You know, they 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 weren't expected to get to the grand final, mm. and uh, so it was a pretty convincing win in the end. Um, but more of a, a relief, you just feel relieved that okay, you 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 know, in your career you've won a grand mm. final, um, and there are so many players, good players, representative players, who haven't won a grand final. Yeah. So, um, so that's that's just you know, sleep sleep better at night. This is where I get excited and this is where everyone listening to the podcast shuffles to the front of their seat a little. May 29, 1991, what stands out? 
He's now given the New South Wales side an opportunity to win the game courtesy of the boot of Michael O'Connor. Two from three for Michael O'Connor. He's three metres in. He's 20 metres out. Gets it away nicely. He's kicked it. He's kicked it. Oh, well, that's uh, State of Origin 2. Yeah. Yeah, we'd lost State of Origin 1, and people don't remember this uh, at Lang Park, uh, but I had an opportunity to kick a goal on full time, which would have evened the score. Mm. Um, and because at the time we had a bloke called Matthew Ridge at Manly, I wasn't uh, practising my goal kicking, but... Um, you know, I, I was the goal kicker, mm. uh, picked as the goal kicker uh, for for New South Wales, and I missed that kick, and I was just really filthy with myself. Yeah. You know, um, you know, I just I, I should. You know, it was it was a tough kick. It was right on the sideline, mm. but had I kicked it, it, would have drawn the game. Griffin Air Conditioning offers the highest quality of air conditioning sales and service across the Sydney metropolitan area providing installation and maintenance to commercial, domestic and industrial customers. Working with this team, you'll be guaranteed the latest services, technology and developments in the industry. Visit griffinair.com.au and tell them we sent you for a cool deal. So, I reckon I spent every available minute or hour uh, between then and the next game, practicing my goal kicking, I'd go down to parks, um, you know, around where I lived, uh, just with myself, with my footballs, and uh, you know, I remember breaking a window down at Bondi Surf Club because I was kicking <laughs> kick, kicking balls up against uh, this brick wall, and I just uh, I skewed one. And uh, but what I did, yeah, at, at the, you know, so w when I when I took that kick, I was actually quite confident, you know. Uh, I, about my goal kicking yeah. and I, I wanted to get it over with mm -hmm. as quick as possible and um, people say to me um, you know the, the pressure you must have felt because uh, you know to miss the goal was sort mm. of series over basically because you know we're uh, one down we, or best we could have do would, would have been to draw the series but yeah um, so the pressure yeah it was yeah it was it was pretty high and I, I just wanted to get it over with as quick as possible so it was, a, it was a fantastic try. It went from one end of the yeah. field to the other. That game, my memory of that game was one of the nastiest uh, uh, games. Yeah, there that was, was a lot the of, game, yeah. A lot of feeling between the teams then, like Steve Walters and uh, Benny Elias. Mm. You had Mark Guyer and Wally and you had people like that and Peter Jackson. They, they, they didn't like us, we didn't like them. Um, and it was a really nasty game. Mm. Mark Guyer just went over the top. I, you know... <laughs> He was really fired up, and uh, so the, you're on edge. And there was a lot of drop ball because of the um, the rain. Yeah, it was a, it was a horrible night. Oh, brutal conditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and then when we scored that try, it was such a relief. I thought, shit, we can we can win this. Yeah. And uh, and uh, it came down to that kick basically. And uh, I just hit it right in the sweet spot. I knew as soon as I hit it that it was. Going Did you up. really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, and um, so that was yeah, that was one of the great kicks of my, my career, with no doubt about it. And that's what I'm probably remembered for more than anything. Was it your finest moment? Would you rather be remembered for something else, or are you happy with how that sits? That's a good question. Yeah, uh, because people don't remember. I had to get back onto uh, after that kick. There was still um, a minute and a half on yep. the clock. And I had to um, pull down. They, there was a turnover, and Queensland got the ball. Yes. And I had to. Um, uh, it was, I had a one-on-one -on -one yeah. with Mal Meninga, and he was steamed up, and and uh, he was running at me like a, 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 a semi-trailer. And uh, I reckon the tackle I made on him after the kick. He's uh, better. Oh, look! I got a lot yeah. more satisfaction out of that, <laughs> uh, bringing him down um, than the kick. But it is funny, isn't it? That you know uh, that you're remembered for. Mm. Um, certain things and I remember Paul Siren saying to me Snoz he said look you're lucky that you know 
it's not as you're lucky because people remember you for that kick. Um, you know, even Don McKinnon, you know, yeah. he gets remembered because he's had a leak at half time. <laughs> 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 I've never done anything. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it's true, isn't it? You know. Considering the conditions, considering the theatre and the aggression of the game, it was a game that dominated headlines afterwards. The game's authorities thought the players had crossed the line and they cracked down hard, they talked tough. They were going to clean up the game. Well, Mal Meninga hadn't forgotten what happened in game number two, whether it was your goal kick or whether it was that tackle on him. He didn't miss you. No, he didn't. And... um... Yeah, I spoke about that uh, that car accident that I had when I was young, and yeah. the, uh, it, it, if there's un, if there's one incident that was uh, that like and it was more like that than anything else yeah. was that incident where getting hit by Mal because he's just he is he's incredibly strong and yeah. uh, and the way he hit me too, I, my, my my head was on the ground, so I had nowhere to go. Mm. Um, but. Uh, it's funny, isn't it? Like because, uh, you know, as a player, you do it. Do, 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 you pretty much do what your coach asks yep. ask you to do. And the, <laughs> their coach was um, my coach. Uh, if you remember, Graham Lowe was coaching Queensland. Yes. Right. So. Yeah. Um, so I've I've heard this, and it, it's second hand, but yeah. uh, that he was under instructions from Graham Lowe after what happened the week before. He was filthy uh, that I kicked that goal. Yeah. Graham Lowe because it you know would have been two up with yeah. going going home to. And Graham Lowe's the Queensland hero despite the fact he's a New Zealander. Yeah. 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 So uh, I've got no doubt that Mal was under instructions to uh, to take me out, and he was just doing what his coach wanted mm. him to do, and. Um, Unfortunately, it was uh, it had a devastating effect on me because I, as the goal kicker, um, I had uh, none for four, none for five, or something that mm. night, and they they weren't hard kicks. I remember taking the kick afterwards after he um, he hit me, and uh, I should have been taken off the field back mm. then. I, you know, I, I got up and collapsed. My legs just were like jelly, and but I took a goal kick and obviously missed it. Mm. Um, so that yeah, I. I that 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 uh, grieves me a little bit. That mm. um, the, the result of that, and um, and and you know, but that's back then. That's the way the game was, you know, and and it has cleaned up significantly yeah. since then. And uh, um, but you do whatever it takes to win, and 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 unfortunately, um, didn't pan out well for me. Rugby league, rugby union has both cleaned up. Society is very different. Which brand of footy do you like more, 1991 brand or 2021? Well, if you'd asked me that a couple of years ago, mm. I'd definitely say 1991, uh, because it's it, it was less structured. Yep. And I, I look at look, in the last couple of years, or you know, the last ten years, you've seen pl- teams just play the same way and yep. uh, very structured, same second man plays. Um, kick in certain positions on the field, uh, whereas we weren't. We, uh, coaches that I played under uh, were not like that. Bob Fulton, uh, Tim Sheens, they mm. they uh, let you play and and express yourself, and and I loved that. That the thing I loved about rugby league was that I could, um, you know, I could do a, a chip and chase, and yep. um, I wasn't afraid to do that back myself. And I scored a lot of tries uh, through just playing off the top of your head mm. and there's got to be some structure I do understand that but I think that the game is starting to swing back a little bit uh, with these new rules I think I like the fact there's only one referee on the field at the moment yeah. I like the fact that they're playing uh, an advantage uh, a six again advantage and um, and, that, and that's speeding up the game and it's becoming a contest whereby you know you've got to be a, a, a fit you know, when 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 we played, like the fittest side generally uh, had a huge advantage, yep. and so you should be rewarded for that, for your fitness, and um, you should be rewarded if you've got a bloke like Glenn Lazarus who can play eighty minutes of football. Mm. You know, you'd uh, rather than a bloke you bring out for twenty minutes. And yeah. So, but I, I, I'm 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 really uh, enjoying actually watching rugby league again now uh, in this new sort of era. Uh, 
but it's still not as good as and we had characters back then too yeah. you know like I agree. Uh, you know sammy Bacco, and uh, there were so many funny guys uh, yep. you know that i played with real characters and um so i wouldn't change it i you know i, I think i came through a really golden era uh in rugby league has the tough stuff or the dirty stuff of the late 80s early 90s it has worked its way out of the game are you glad to see that side of the game gone that element of the game yeah i am and yeah. uh and that was a thing with me and I, and and people had said to me i remember uh oh, the number of people because i was doing a little bit of media work and I, yes. and I just couldn't get over it like uh that you could go and play at Lidkim or somewhere like that and it wasn't a tv game and mm. it was just open warfare you know you'd have um every tackle you'd be hit high and uh and I just thought from a player safety, uh, you know, concern uh, that they should get the, 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 the tackles down. And I, remember, I remember saying that, you know, the, the tackle, you know, they're saying around the, the chest, or at least the chest, but, um, you know, even around the waist, I was sort of saying, you know, maybe you've got to look at doing that. And, uh, but that would fundamentally change and there were too many old sort of people mm. uh, would never, ever sort of agree to that. But... Uh, oh, yeah, I, um, I I did speak up about it at the time mm. uh, because you know it was just it was a in with some games <laughs> uh, the attitude well we've got to get them before they get us basically and uh, wow so yeah there was a lot of head high stuff and and you know I I think it's a shame uh, that you've got players now you know when you go to uh, these mental league lunches who um who are you know they're not in great physical no, shape not. yeah and um but they i mean they were different times and and i can understand uh everything you know uh but i think the game has been significantly cleaned up um all for the better random question who's the best goal kicker you've seen is that an easy or a hard question to answer uh best ever well the best i, I think matthew ridge would have to go close okay yeah he you know it, i'd watch him at training i I'd, you know like i was happy for him to take over the goal kicking duties you were oh yeah yeah because he at training like he he could kick 10 and 10 from 10 from the sideline like he was just so accurate wow. and uh so I'd have to say Matthew Ridge. Yep. 19 State of Origins, 18 Test Matches, Captain of Manly. At the end of 92, you called retirement, 32 years of age. From our seats, the legs still look fresh. Was it the right time, in hindsight? It's a little bit. I think it was, yeah, because <clears throat> you, you reach a stage in your life where you're starting to think, well, what am I going to do when I finish playing football? Mm. Um and uh, and I, I started to get a little bit concerned, and, and that that feeling that I used to get about going to training, I started to sort of uh, start thinking about other things and pursue, you know, like should should I be doing this? And yep. uh, you start um, <clears throat> sort of planning for the future. And I, with rugby league, you've got to be in it all or nothing. It's yeah. uh, it's not one of those games you can just sort of have a uh, <laughs> you know. Like, um, you're just only partially up. invested in yeah, it. Yeah, show up. You got to you got to be putting mm. in more than you you know just going to training. It's about thinking. And my wife used to get uh, sort of upset with me because on a Friday, like um, I'd always say, have go and have drinks with your girlfriends, um, mm. because I was just non-talkative. I yeah. I didn't you know there was no communication. Um, and she 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 learned over the years that you know and 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 that's because you're preparing and you're thinking about the game yeah. and you know if 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 this was to happen and you know we've been training to do this move and well I should be here and uh you've got to be thinking like that all the time and trying to anticipate mm. and and uh and when there's a try scoring opportunity you've got to take it and so when you start to lose that and I I felt like I started to lose that and also I played in a state of origin and um uh, Willie Kahn ran around me and I, I'd never had that happen to me before he just uh, he just I don't know stepped around me and went and I, I just didn't have the, I, I thought oh this so when when you're feeling that um, another player is better than you yep but footballers are like mate they're like boxers they, yeah they think that they're the best and um, and when when you don't think you're the best uh, it's the time to get out that was your 
alarm bell, was it? Willie oh, yeah, Hahn? yeah, yeah. He just did it so easily, mm. and uh, oh, you know, I did. I really, I felt embarrassed uh, yeah. that he, you know, got around me. I let him get around me, and he just took off. Then I didn't have the, you know, he just he burned me, and uh, so yeah, that, it was a combination of those things and feelings, mm. and you know, and I think it was probably the right decision. You don't get any better. Um, when you get into your thirties, and and the rare exception, if you're a playmaker like a, a, a you know Cameron Smith yeah. or a you know a Cliff Lyons, or, you know, and but I'm talking about genius players yep. who, uh, you know, just uh, who can get away with just and, and the team is so you're so reliant on them because mm. of their knowledge. Um, I probably wasn't one of those players. I was more of an individual uh, opportunist, uh, finishing sort of a player than a creator. When you look back on the athletic journey, what are you most proud of? Is there a memory or a moment? Is there an achievement? Is there a game? What stands out? Uh, I, th- I think you always, your first time that you're recognised and you get selected to pay, play for uh, for your country, mm. and that was after that Possibles Probables game at Concord Oval uh, in 1979. Uh, and I got, I, I heard my name uh, read out to go to Argentina, and uh, I just was so, I, I couldn't, I, I had to walk outside of the function, and I went and sit, sat in the gutter for a while, and just sort of, uh, did that really, I mean, am I really going to Argentina? Yeah. And and I'll never forget that, and, and you know, to get selected to play for your country. Mm. And then also, just the relief, and I really wanted to, uh, to, to I, I knew I wasn't ready initially, uh, to play for Australia mm. in rugby league, and that was tough too, you know. Uh, it was a really tough road, but it was always a goal of mine, you mm. know, once I changed over, to try and reach the top there, and that was a great... Um, I just felt a great sense of achievement. Not so, It wasn't so much um, when I, I got selected in 85. I, I think I was, I was raw then still. Mm. I'd only had two years of uh, league, uh, and I didn't play test matches in New Zealand, but that 86... Uh, tour where we um we went through undefeated yep um that was a great you know that was that was one of the highlights i think yeah you would certainly come full circle in the respect that you would post career end up in the aru system it's quite possibly a podcast for another time as i'm story i'm sure there's stories uh, that would go on for hours but you coached you serve as a selector advisor was it nice to give something back to the game and remain involved or do you look back now and think geez it was all too hard no and i felt i i did owe rugby union um that okay i did and um coming back and also just going living back here in queensland uh I, sons and the local rugby club they played um riley my youngest bloke i coached him for a number of years uh, so I was sort of getting back to the grassroots, and then uh, the game, the game of rugby, is is in good shape at grassroots, yep. and uh, and that sort of uh, then then I wanted to sort of uh, I was really lucky actually, uh, not like I, I was at a funeral, um, uh, and I ran into a guy called Jeff Miller. Yeah. who was just after me and he was at the time uh, a high performance manager of the Australian rugby mm. and uh, it was not long after rugby league oh, sorry rugby union became professional mm. and he said to me would you be interested in um, in talking to players and, and looking at young players uh, in rugby league uh, who you think would be suitable to play rugby union uh, now that the rugby union is professional, so I was in the right place at the right time. Yeah. I, I managed to get this job uh, recruiting, and so I got involved with uh, the early uh, experiments with uh, Matt Rogers, with Lottie Dakiri, with Wendell Saylor, mm. talking to those guys, and you know, and they, and they came over. Ultimately, were, were great for the game, great for rugby union. Those guys, um, you know, I remember s- sitting at Ballymore and. Uh, you know, and, and Wendell Saylor, like just the buzz about having Wendell playing rugby yeah. union, it was just, it was brilliant, mm. you know. Um, and and those guys went on to have extremely successful Wallaby careers. Yep. Uh, great for the game. Uh, so I was really fortunate I got involved there and I did it at a, at a junior level as well. And I sort of fell into 
there was a job vacancy for a manager uh, of the Australian Sevens team. Mm. And Jeff Miller said to me, uh, this is back in about 2001, or he said, uh, look, we haven't got anybody to manage the team um, uh, over Christmas, Christmas, New Year. Um, they're going to Argentina and Chile. And, yep. and she said, <laughs> yeah, he said to me, uh, can you ask, can you check with Susan? Would that be okay? I said, I don't have to check with Susan. <laughs> That's me. Anyway, yeah. I'll never forget it because I wasn't a, you know, I had no um, history of being a manager. Yeah. Um, and I do remember Susan dropping me at the airport, Brisbane airport, and uh, she laughs about it. She said, you know, remember the last thing you said to me was, uh, you wouldn't have a pen on you, would you? <laughs> 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 and, uh, it, it was a bit like that and uh, from there I, I went over and uh, I mean Matt Gitto was on that um, trip um, and I could see that, uh, just the potential uh, of the game and mm. we've got big crowds in um, a place called Mar del Plata mm. in, um, in, in Argentina and we played at Santiago and you know good healthy crowds of 10,000 people I thought gee this is um and I, I did play sevens uh, mm. when I played rugby and played in the Hong Kong sevens on three occasions with the Ella boys and we had we won the comp up there one year and uh, I could see the potential of the game and uh, and at the very least just as a as a, a, a talent ID uh, which which I was into mm. uh, a talent ID exercise uh, because having seven players out on the field I mean if you've got any weaknesses they're soon exposed yeah. Yeah, so that was um, it was a great break for me to be able to uh, get involved with the sevens, and then I subsequently became coach mm. um, under Robbie Deans. Robbie Deans asked me to coach uh, the team when he took over the fifteens, and he worked a lot closer with the sevens uh, okay. as a talent ID um, uh, avenue as well. So yeah I was lucky I was in the, but I, I do feel a sense that I did owe rugby something because I, I felt as I walked out on uh, on them when I went to rugby league and uh, so it sort of came full circle really do you still love your footy both codes are you one of us that throughout winter from Friday night to Sunday the TV's pretty much on some form of rugby yeah 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 uh, yeah, I, I pick and choose a little bit now, and uh, I still have a soft spot for obviously Manly and uh, and Saints, mm. and uh, I generally watch their games or always watch their games. But uh, and, and but if there's a big game on um, Penrith, Parramatta, or uh, look a good game of footy, I don't care. You know, yeah. you, you, you soon you soon get into it, and so I still enjoy it. I'm uh, you know. Um, Still watching the rugby as well. Enjoy the rugby. So, watch the golf. Watch you. <laughs> a sporting tragic. Yeah. You made the difficult look easy with speed, grace, and a style that was very distinctly your own. An amazing cross code athlete, and you remain, as I said earlier, quite possibly the most understated great the game has produced. Michael O'Connor, thank you. You, sir, are a legend. We hope you enjoyed the Michael O'Connor story. If you did, before you go, we'd ask you to leave a five-star rating and review on the podcast app you're currently listening on. It helps us spread the word as we continue to grow the podcast. Make sure you come back soon, legends. Legends.